So this is the core of the course. It really is. We're going to go on to the language stuff afterwards, but, it, but even the language stuff is based on categorization. And again, because we don't have any secrets, it's because wor words are mostly the names of categories. And so what you want to do is um, find out how we have words, how it is that we name words. And in order to, to, to name things with words, we have to have the categories. And so then the question is, how do we get the categories? Uh, it'll be about things like learning, because although there's a certain number of categories that we're born with, uh, again, the dictionary test is probably the best one. Open up a dictionary and look at how many of the entries look as if it would make sense that we have an inborn detector for those things. I mean, it's very few. Most of the things are learned. Uh, important that the reason it's called categorical, there's lots of reasons. It's because it's discrete rather than continuous. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But it's also because um, it's sort of a zero-one thing. It really is like the binary bits of, uh, of uh, digital computation. Something is, although, for example, with animals, you have a taxonomy of animals where you have zebras, giraffes, etc. Nevertheless, for any given animal, like an elephant, if I point to something, it either is or it isn't an elephant. So it's positive or negative instances. There's something privileged in anything categorical about a yes, no, all or none decision, and that's important. Correction is important because um, because I'll be talking about two ways of acquiring categories, supervised and unsupervised learning. And in supervised learning, you're corrected when you make a mistake. And that's how you learn. And that's important. And of course, rules and invariants, the, the, the underlying, this is also a controversial uh, question, and we discussed a little bit on the, on the, I think you were already there when we were discussing the classical theory of categorization in the French session. Necessary and sufficient no, no, conditions. I Oh, or were you there the week before? Oh, sorry, you were there the week before. Yeah. So um, one of the big questions is, is there anything wrong with the so-called classical theory? It's not really a theory of categorization. The classical theory is that um, something is a member of a category if and only if it has the necessary it, it has the necessary and sufficient conditions for being in that category. Now, that's too strong, too formal. That's not what your head does when you look at an apple. But, un but, but there is a little bit of truth in it, as there always is, because um, when you do look at an apple and recognize an apple, unless there's some magic going on, there has to be something in what goes into your um, eyes that allows, that gives you a basis for distinguishing apples from non-apples. So although it's not necessary conditions and it's not logic, there are some, there has to be some invariant feature of the input that on the basis of which you can sort. Now, it becomes a little bit more complicated when the input is not concrete, like looking at an apple is something like justice. Were you, there? you weren't there when we were discussing justice in the French. No. Did we get out of phase here? Is it that they got ahead? They are ahead, of course. They are ahead, yeah. Yeah, they are ahead. No, no, behind. They're behind. No, they're behind. I don't know. We just got into some topics that we didn't get into on the, on the McGill um, version. But uh, there is a question about abstract categories, right? Uh, apples, it's clear. They have properties. You distinguish <coughs> apples from non-apples by certain features. And what about justice, or what, what's just and unjust, and what's true and not true, etc.? That's a little bit more complicated, because what is it? With apples, you can say, what is it that all instances of apples that you ever see have in common? Could be uh, a, a set of either-or properties, but still there should be a sort of a string of properties that allow you to distinguish all instances of apples from non-apples. What about all instances of true? I mean, surely that, that's what Fodor calls a vanishing intersection. If you put all of the instances of true on top of one another, you, there's nothing they all have in common, Neither, not even in an even, in either-or sense, except in the, the most useless sense, which is it's either this or that or that or that or that, giving all examples. That's not a rule. That's just, OK. So and then finally, there's implicit and impl explicit learning. I'll talk about that, too, because remember what we said about cognitive science is that um, the job of cognitive science is to figure out how you, how you work, how you manage to do everything you can do. Your head does it unconsciously. Otherwise, you could sit in a chair and simply observe how you do it and then report it, and then, you, and then you'd have solved cognitive science. So a lot of the stuff that's going on that allows you to do all of the things you can do, is un most of it is unconscious. Some of it isn't. That's called explicit learning, where you can actually say how it is, or at least say at least how part of what you're doing 
you're doing. And I'll talk about that as well. And of course, the mushrooms, I mean, there's a few hallmarks of every single talk that I give. There's always mushrooms, there's always chicken bottoms, and there's always a Chinese Chinese dictionary. You just can't get away from it. So mushrooms, it's this allegory, which is a good one. It's sort of a little thought experiment that that collapses all of cognition in just one little situation. You're, you're a mushroom forager in a mushroom world. The only thing you have to do in order to survive and reproduce is to feed yourself, and the only thing there is to feed yourself on is mushrooms, but mushrooms come in two varieties, the poisonous kind and the edible kind. So your task is to learn what's edible and what isn't. That's why the mushrooms are there. With the, we'll get to the chickens in the Chinese dictionary later. So what is categorization? Categorization is to do, to categorize, is to do what needs to be done with the kind of thing that you need to do with, do it with, right? A category is, is a kind of thing, and categorization is doing what you need to do with that kind of thing and not do with things that are not that kind of thing. Now, to get back to the mushrooms, because they're always easier to understand than these abstract <coughs> principles, with a mushroom, with mushrooms, in that mushroom world, you have to learn which mushrooms you can, you can eat and which ones are, you can't. Eating is a thing you do with mushrooms. You put them in your mouth. And um, toadstools you avoid. Okay? So that's categorization. It's, it's um, very general. And we ourselves are adaptive creatures, autonomous, meaning independent sensory motor agents m mucking around in the world, trying to survive and reproduce in a, in a world of objects which have certain affordances. Now, I talked about invariance. Invariance, we usually talk about invariance as sort of a, 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 a passive stimulus property. You know, this is uh, everything that has stripes, right? That's an invariant. A it has nothing to do with me if it has stripes. But an affordance is a generalization of the idea of invariant to stuff that, um, it's, it's definitely properties of the, of the object, but it's properties of objects that depend on properties of me. It depends on what I can do with it. So if Gibson's classical example is that uh, a chair is anything that affords sitability upon, right? Something you can sit on. It's not enough to say it's a wooden thing with, with four legs because not all chairs have are wooden and have four legs, right? But uh, if you want to pick the most general notion of chair, it's whatever you can sit on. You can even call a rock. This is my chair for this afternoon, right? Because it's something you can sit on. And there are things, and there are things that don't fit in there. You can't. Your ocean, an ocean can't be your chair. A ceiling can't be your chair. A pin can't. A long pin can't be your chair. So there are things that are not chairs, and there are things that are chairs, even in this very general sense. And it's and it's based on a special kind. Sorry, a more general kind of in, invariant, namely an, an invariant that involves sensory motor interactions between the shape of my body if you like, and the shape of the thing. So these are, here are some examples on the board of, of uh, Gibsonian affordances, right? A, a, a round hole affords putting round things into, but not square things. And uh, a, a, a doorknob has to be convex like that. It affords putting your finger around. If it was flat like this, you couldn't open the door. Can't call, I can't call this a doorknob. For those who can't see this, I'm holding, it looks like that figure over there. And uh, it's, it's basically like the sensory motor thing is like putting pegs into the right size uh, hole where your body is the, is, what, is the peg and the hole is the object out there. And of course there are some things that go beyond that. An Escher drawing, is, it, it doesn't afford anything. You, locally it looks like you can walk up these stairs but then you end up with something inverted. So it's an impossible world. Um, and it does depend on the shape of our bodies. So, uh, so uh, the affordances of the world for a spider or for, a, for a, an, a, an, a, an octopus or for an eagle are different from the affordances of a person because, because what, their shape is different. And that includes not only um, affordances for, in the end, like, just like with language and with grounding, it eventually gets beyond just the sensory motor stuff because there's things that a kid can do because he can talk. And that's not based on his shape anymore, but it's still an aff affordance. Right? Now, I'll come back to this, of course, because I can't treat the whole thing here. But So if we agree that a category is a kind of thing that you do a certain kind of thing with, and if we agree that you have to learn for most categories what are, those, what are the kinds of things you do what kind of things with, and that that learning isn't always obvious, 
Once you have learned what an apple is, that you can eat it, it's like a mushroom that you're, it's safe to eat, you can also name it. Now, we talked about this in other classes about uh, the uh, uh, saussure and the arbitrariness of the name. Um, what's the difference between naming an apple by biting into it, quote unquote naming it, categorizing it, and calling it an apple? The main difference is that uh, apple does not resemble and is not functionally related in any physical way to, to, uh, to apples. It's just an arbitrary thing that I do, just like biting is an arbitrary thing I do, but the, but the biting is um, sort of a, a practical, real-world action, whereas naming is just an arbitrary thing, and it's important. It turns out to be important, because if you remember uh, when I defined a, what a symbol system was, I said it was basically scratches on paper whose shape is arbitrary, but we have a convention as to what you're allowed to do with them, and that's what syntax is manipulation of symbols based on their shape, and their shape is arbitrary. Now, the symbols, especially in English, but also in arithmetic, also have a meaning. And the real heart of arbitrariness is that the shape of the symbol is not related to the meaning of the symbol. Plus addition is not related to the shape of a plus sign. Adding something has nothing to do with something that's shaped like a cross, right? And that's important because in classical symbol manipulation, and remember there's no symbol grounding problem for arithmetic or for logic or whatever, because those are just symbol systems. For that, it's critically important that your symbols should be arbitrary, because if every time you wanted to refer to zero, you had to somehow get something that looked like nullity. I don't even know what looks like nullity, but if it had to be look like nullity, it's a little bit analogous to uh, geometry, if you like. I mean, congruence in the sense of Euclid is just a, another squiggle squaggle, right? Uh, uh, could, but, but, but you also have these figures where you can see that congruent means that the, that the triangle sort of fits on top of the other triangle. You're not allowed to, remember, you're not allowed to use that in geometry. When you're doing a proof in geometry, which is symbolic, you can only use the axioms and the rules, which are purely symbolic. You're allowed to use the figure to guide your intuitions, but the figure is not part of the... By the way, feel free to, even though I'm doing this, if there's something that's not clear, ask me. Cool. Okay. So I don't want to go on with this too, too long, because uh, this is a, this is, we're going to come back to this with language. But I just want to point out that whereas apple is the arbitrary thing that we call that red round stuff that we've learned as a category already, and red apple, and I really deliberately say it fast, red apple, as if it was all one name, I could call red apple, red apples, and I could call green apple, green apples. That would be another arbitrary name, right? Whereas apple red, and I'm deliberately leaving out the is because in many languages um, you don't even need the is. In order to say the apple is red, that's something different. That's not a name anymore, right? Apple is a name, red apple is a name, but apple is red is in another dimension, and we'll get back to that. But I pointed out to you before that the transition from one to the other is not as easy as the transition from um, practical and analog responses to arbitrary responses. That's easy. If language was just how do we get from from doing things with categories that resemble them or that or that are or that have an affordance thing to something arbitrary, that would be simple. We just get arbitrary, you know, drop all the other frills and you just do an arbitrary thing. But when it comes to apple is red, there's something more going on. So categorization is very general. You have it in set theory. Uh, a thing is a member of a category if it's inside it, and it's a member of the complement of the category if you like. If it's outside, if it's if it's uh, outside one of these circles, um, you can have category membership, which is in Funes the memorious sense uh, a particular view at one instant of a dog. Fido is a member of the category Fido, and so is the next instance that you see, etc. But those are just instances. Whereas um, th that's called membership. And then you also have uh, inclusion, where, where, for example, all dogs are mammals. That's no longer about instance. It's about categories being in categories. With, with, with membership, it's about an instance being a member of a category. And with, um, with inclusion, it's about a category being. But it doesn't matter, because in both cases, it's categorization. One is sort of more direct or more lower level, and the other is higher level and it's about individuals. And in general, there's a lot of stuff about individuals I don't want to get into unless you raise it. 
there are complications about individual versus kinds, because categories are kinds. I'll just mention in passing, because it's relevant, that um, as far as psychology is concerned, apart from Funes the Memorias, there are no individuals. When I look at John right now, right, I mean, we tend to say, all right, there are people, that's a, that's a kind, and then there's John, he's an individual, he's not a kind. He is a kind, as far as my nervous system is concerned, because I have to recognize John no matter where he is, no matter how he's dressed, no matter what angle, no matter how old he is, it's all still John. So from the categorical point of view, you're a category too, not just an individual, right? <laughs> All right, but that I don't want to get into that because that leads to lots of interesting but um, co but 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 time-consuming complications. Now, chickens. I promised the chicken sex scene. Now we won't get into the chickens yet. They come later. I just wanted to show them as an example of categories. You have mushrooms, sorting edible and inedible. Uh, and, oh, by the way, what it says here in French is um, uh, kind. Um, sort of uh, species and, and a genus, remember what you have in, so you can have a, a species is a, is, a, is a category, it's already a collection, and a genus is a bigger category, that's clearly inclusion. And then you have individual and species, that's not inclusion, that's membership, except with John, because at least, ex except for psychology with John, John is actually also a category. And then there's this distinction between token and type, which I, philosophers love, and, and the, that other, that, that French version of this course has a, a predominance of philosophers, so we talk about type token, but I think we can live life without ever knowing the word. So unless you bring it up, I'm not going to talk about type token. Just for the record, uh, G, the letter G, brought to you, you know, Sesame Street type letter G, right, is a type, and then every instance of G that you see is a token. That's type token. Okay. Big deal. Now, um, so you have, you have, mushrooms and categorizing mushrooms. You have tables and sorting things into what is and isn't a table. I've forgotten why I put in, oh yeah, frogs, you know, different kinds of frogs. These are all frogs. And you have cards. Now the reason I put cards down there is because I'm going to want to make a distinction. I think it's the next transparency between supervised and unsupervised learning. But anyway, so far we just see examples here of categories. And the chickens, my favorite example, because they're so hard, is male and female newborn chicks. And it turns out that sexing newborn chicks is extremely difficult. I'll get to that. Um, the Chinese Chinese Dictionary is just to remind you, this is not to get back into Searle, but just to remind you that until further notice, until you give me some more material, Words are just words, and with words and a dictionary or an encyclopedia or a lecture, all you can get is more words, right? So unless there's something behind at least some of those words that's other than just more words or more definitions or more descriptions, it's all just meaningless squiggles and squoggles. So the idea is that categorization can ground dictionaries. It doesn't mean that every time you encounter a new category name in a dictionary, which is 99% of uh, the words, 99.9% 90, .9 of the words in a dictionary, are either the names of objects or events or actions or, 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 or uh, properties or uh, states. That every time you encounter a new category, you have to go out in the world and, and learn what it is. You can learn things from words alone. That's presumably what we're doing now. But in order to be able to get new categories, from words alone, the words, the, the words in, the, in the explanation or the definition have to be grounded. And it's fine if they're grounded in other words, but it can't be words all the way down. Right? And we're talking about how to cash it in at the very bottom. So back to, I don't know why I have it quite in this order, but um, back to invariance. Um, we know, for example, that uh, size invariance, this is related to the John category problem. The reason that I recognize John as being John, whether he's near or far, is because I have my nervous system, and this is probably an innate, mostly innate uh, category. I, can, I, can, I, have, I have the distance constancy and size constancy for three-dimensional shapes. So the shape looks the same to me, whether it's near or far, big or small, and also, no matter how it's oriented, 
Um, that's why you can do this uh, shepherd's mental rotation task, because we can recognize that something is the same, even though it's in a different orientation. For Funes the Memorius, it would be impossible, because for him, every instance, close, far, big, small, is infinitely unique. Categorization involves finding the invariance in all of that variation and ignoring all the variation. Otherwise. All of this is going into Sean's notes. Okay. One of the ways to look at it is that, that you know, James, William James talked about the, the, the blooming, buzzing confusion that the, ba that the baby sees. Who knows if that's true? Uh, probably there's a, some prepared... First, the baby doesn't see much in the beginning anyway, but probably once it starts seeing, there are some prepared categories. That, uh, not, and it's not even necessarily visual, but for example, learning to, to nurse from the mother's breast is not a blank slate ca uh, learning case, otherwise we'd have a lot of babies that never make it, <laughs> right? They're, 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 um, they're dete there are breast detectors and, 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 and uh, feeding detectors that are already built in to a certain extent. You need some exposure and a little bit of fine tuning, but uh, that's not a blank slate. And figure ground distinctions are probably another blank slate, but it's probably not <clears throat> too bad an image, the upper left uh, black and white photograph here, that without, until we learn the categories, the world is pretty much a sort of a mumbo jumbo of some sort. Certainly more of a, kind of out of focus, even if it's not totally uh, a wash, it's kind of out of focus. And categories bring it into focus, I, I can't do it with this thing, but this is actually a ULES figure, you know, the way, when you look at these ULES, a stereogram, so okay. you can actually, it's a stereogram that you can do with one. I can usually do it with one, um, pardon me, not with one eye, but, but without having to have the, uh, the, the stereo thing. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, and, and the idea is that eventually, because of category learning, things are sorted out into the discrete objects that we do see uh, and, and feel and hear and taste and smell. Now, some of the innate categories, there are innate categories. One of a, 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 a prominent example is facial expressions. We don't actually learn from, from scratch uh, to distinguish a smiling face from a frowning face. We've already got some prepared tendencies in that direction. We need some exposure in order to do it. But, um, but the wiring that connects, and this is mirror neurons, the wiring that connects what it feels like to smile and what it feels like to look at someone smiling is probably already it's in the same sense, it's, it's already in place, in the, probably in the same sense that, for example, for the vervets who have three kinds of calls, the, 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 the eagle call or the, the bird of prey call, the, lep, the, the um, leopard call, for, and then the, the serpent call for the, for, the, for the danger from the ground, the three different areas of danger. Those calls also, vervets have to have a little bit of exposure and uh, observation to pick them up, but they're very strongly biased uh, towards doing that already. So those are prepared categories. And there are other prepared categories like color. We don't, contrary to the Whorf hypothesis, uh, we don't learn to see colors as qualitatively distinct depending on how our languages and cultures decide to cut up the spectrum. Even if we call blue and green by the same name, if you do a discrimination task on people, it'll turn out that they have a boundary between blue and green so that they can certain ranges are easier to tell apart than other ranges. And it's not just, so that's a prepared category as well because it turns out that for our species, color is an extremely important, not so much a direct category, it's an important uh, property category for other things. Right? It's easier. That's why, for example, when you want to, when you want to do a, a Word document and you want to highlight some stuff, it's, it makes it pop out right away if you make it come out in another color. And that's the same in foraging for food and things like that. Uh, now, there are people like Jerry Fodor who get a little bit carried away with this uh, inborn category stuff and, and, and kind of think that everything is inborn. And I've called his theory the Big Bang Theory of the Origin of Categories. Instead of evolving, as ours do, or being learned, as most of ours do, his are already kind of there. You wonder in what sense they're there. Uh, his main... I won't dwell on this because this is the, uh, this is the stuff of the second or th from last or third from last uh, talk about Chomsky and, uh, and um, universal grammar. But um, 
you don't have secrets. So at least no need. So the, the, the essence of that is, is, is that um, Chomsky, a genius, did something monumental that nobody else had, had ever done. And that was to, uh, across years of, of excavation, if you like, um, <clears throat> unearth a structure a set of rule, uh, a structure. It's a, it's a set of it's a, it's a set of rules and 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 uh, invariants, just like what you do with categorization, that allows us to do a, a very, um, a very um, skillful form of categorization that we can all do. Namely, we can tell apart sentences that are syn syntactically correct from the ones that are incorrect. And there's, as I think I said before, there's two kinds of syntactically incorrect sentences. I ain't go to the store today is syntactically incorrect, but there's, it's not Chom it, that's not a violation of Chomskyan grammar. Mm. Uh, that's something you learn. And, it's, and there's nothing deeply wrong with I ain't, I ain't go to the store today. It's just that we have certain conventions that, that this violates. But we learn the conventions, and, and, and we could abandon the conventions. And you per understand perfectly well, everything will be fine. But there's also an infinity, and I'm not a linguist, so I'm not good at giving examples. But there's an infinity of violations that we also know is just as wrong as I ain't go to the store. And this, I'll give you one now, because it's the only one I know. Who did he think that went out? You know that's wrong. Who did he think that went out? So what is it? Who did he think went out? It's who did he think went out? Or who did he uh, imagine? Who did he... Who did he think went out is one way of saying it. And the other way is, uh, who did he think of that went out? That's fine. But who did he think that went out doesn't, is wrong. And it's deeply wrong, not, not superficially wrong. And in fact, it's part of an iceberg that is huge. And Chomsky explained the rules that we need to have built in in order to be able to, from, almost from the beginning, distinguish the things that violate them and that don't. And his, his reason for finally deciding that this grammar has to be innate is not just that we don't get taught this these rules, but that these rules, remember I told you that a category consists of positive and negative instances. A child only hears and only produces sentences that conform to Chomsky's grammar. You have to be sitting in a, in a, in a, in a, in a table in MIT and saying, why can't you say, who did he think that went out? in order to realize that, yes, in fact, there's lots of logically possible ways that things could have been said that are immediately rejected by us. It's a category we know right away, but we don't know what the rules are underneath. So the rules are implicit, un not, not known. Anyway, that's Chomsky and grammar. I'm going to be talking about that later. Fodor is not a syntactician and who's not a genius. <laughs> he's very clever, but he's not a genius. Um, decided that he was going to do the same kind of, well, that's the poverty of the stimulus. It says that, that, that because there's only, you only get examples of what's grammatical but not what's agrammatical, the child can't learn from the input that it gets. Well, he says you have the same problem with categories. And his argument for the poverty, a kind of a poverty of the stimulus is that if you took, in fact, uh, I don't know if I can do this, I can't go backwards in the presentation, but remember the one where I showed all those tables overlapping with tables? He says if you took all of the instances of even table looking for the invariant, the intersection of all the... Remember, even earlier, I had the, the picture of the s sets that were intersecting with one another, and then you had the part that they all have in common. The intersection would be empty. There would be nothing in common among all of the cases. Therefore, it can't be the case that we learn what's a table and what isn't. We must already know it. Now, I, no, anybody want to anyone, anybody wanna have a crack at that? Very briefly. Because he's going to put an end to the session in two seconds. Um, well, you could have uh, a lot that overlap and then learn, even if it doesn't technically overlap, just being told that, no, this too is a table well, would be a way to... That one way around it would be if, um, if you got corrections. But, but, but it's much simpler than that. I mean, the point is... Yeah. I think afford, affordances, like what are the affords? It's all, all fine. All tables afford putting stuff on them. See, we're, we're all in agreement that, that, that we can learn what tables are, but, but this vanishing intersection argument says that whereas you do get positive and negative instances of tables, so it's not as if you don't, it's not like the Chomsky situation where all you get is this is a table, that's a table, and everything's a table, so figure out what a table is. You do get tables and non-tables. There's nothing that tables and non-tables all have in common, and your answer is right. Well, at the very least, well, the table is a little bit 
tougher. Maybe it's something you can eat on, whatever. They're, at the very least, there's stuff that has some properties that, that allow you to call it, and, and other stuff that doesn't have it. And therefore, it's not a vanishing intersection. It's very general. It is very general. It can include affordances. It may not just be, I think that's what you meant, actually. It may not just be in the, in the stimulus ca characteristic, but in the interaction. He yeah, would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're right. Oh, sorry. It's a long-winded way of saying right. <laughs> Sweet. So uh, that's it. Anyway, but, so let's forget about innate categories. Most categories, yeah. Uh, so could table be in a category like John be self-referential? Meaning what? In the what? sense that every time you experience and meet a table, you, like, the table takes on a different, a different form, a different, like... All tables are different, forms. there's no yeah, question. They're all different. They're all different, but, but the point is that there's something they also all have in common. That's the invariant. Yeah. It's very abstract, I suppose, all the things you can eat off, but it's still an invariant. Okay, um, so here are, new, are a bunch of categories that you would pick out of a dictionary or pick or Google. Yeah. Oh, well, can he just respond that you could easily just say here here is a table that you can't eat on for whatever reason, and it's still yeah. a table. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. In fact, all right, fine. This is the right time for me to give you. That's a good point. Actually, it's a very good point. And uh, let me give you the the intuition that that um, takes care of it. Well, I want to. I think learning. So that's a learned. Learn thing that okay it doesn't fit the the general affordance that we use to categorize a table but because we've learned a rule that so there is a vanishing intersection but it, it's compensated by learning by by social convention you mean? Yeah, by language by okay I've linked it with another it's still a table because everyone tells me it's still a table even though it doesn't yeah but even if it was as arbitrary as saying look all of the other tables you could eat on but this one's a table too except you can't eat on it that would just be it's sort of like a little bit like Gödel's proof for every system always has an unprovable one, so, but you can always add the unprovable one to the system, and then you have, but then you generate another uh, unprovable one. So uh, the, the point is that you can't just arbitrarily, and by the way, you can also do that with uh, universal grammar. Everything like, even wh who did he think that went out, which is a violation of uh, universal grammar. We could all agree that at least that one particular case we're going to accept, but then we have another infinity to deal with. And the same thing is true here. Uh, in the end, there has to be an invariant. It can't be just... Um, even if you if you add a finite set of exceptions, it's still an invariant. It says that you know uh, a e uh, pardon me uh, a e i o u and sometimes y right. Still an invariant. That's why I said an invariant can be a, can can be a disjunction. Whereas Fodor says it has to be empty. Okay, but let me give you the peekaboo unicorn anyway because it, it goes in. I thought you meant something. Sorry, I thought you, uh, that was good, but I thought you meant something even better. Uh, and this and this would have been the answer to that. What about the peekaboo unicorn, talking about a, a, a vanishing intersections. Um, let me define a, a, uni, uni, a, peek, a, a unicorn is a, is a, is a horse with, a, with one horn. They don't happen to exist, but so what? That's, we're, we're among friends. We still understand a unicorn, if you do, right? So, um, but a peekaboo unicorn is worse than a unicorn. Because uh, a peekaboo unicorn is a horse with one horn that vanishes without a trace whenever senses or measuring instruments are trained on it. In other words, in principle, I mean, you talk about vanishing intersections, there's no way that you can pick up something that pickable unicorns share, because they're not there. And the answer really is uh, an object lesson in the power of language and grounding. Namely, that's a perfectly well-defined category, even though I can't see it, and even though it's, so it goes in the spirit of what you're saying. Namely, I have defined something. It's called a peekable unicorn. What is it defined as? It is a horse with a horn that vanishes without a trace whenever senses or measuring instruments are aimed at it. All of that is completely understandable. And I've defined a category. That's a little bit the spirit of what you're saying. It's, it's naive to say there must be some sensory property there, because there's no sensory property, because these can't be sensed by definition. Nevertheless, the power of grounding and the power of a dictionary and of language, etc., is that once you've grounded a certain number of categories, like horse, etc., etc., you can you can define things like peekaboo unicorns. So a peekaboo unicorn is another kind of a sideways way of dealing with the same problem yep. of just and unjust. And exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Okay. Good. Hmm. Frightening. Okay. Now the chicken sexing. Um, 
This is a very, very, very hard task. How many of you read the categorization paper that I wrote? You read it? The, so, the one for last week? Yeah. Okay, so, so it's all right. So, so uh, you remember, uh, some of these punchlines are already there, but, but um, it's... Can you give us the background on what it is? Because I've only heard... Well, okay, I have to point out that I am a vegan, and I have moral objections to this, uh, to, uh, de deep moral objections to, to all of it. To the sexing or to the... What to all of it, because you know why they sex them? Because they want to throw the males into a plastic bag. Right. Okay, so the idea is not to waste. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you want egg layers, get yeah. rid of the ones that. Uh, but I can't say the ones with the penis because they they don't have penises. They're really, really, really hard to tell apart. And time is money, so they have these conveyor belts where the ch the newborn chicks roll down. You quickly turn them over, invert their abdomen, try to tell if they're male or female, and toss them this way or, or put them that way if they're if mm. uh, left in the bag if they're male and toss. Place. Yeah, yeah, toss in place, right? So. The, because time is money and because this is extremely difficult, uh, it takes, allegedly, it takes years to become a grandmaster chicken sexer, a, a, an eighth degree black belt chicken sexer, okay? And in fact, actually, the eighth degree black belt chicken sexes are only exist in Japan. I don't know why, but Japan turned out to be the, the grandmaster of, of chicken sexing. And, and here is an example of, of a, of a uh, training, of, of, supervised training of chicken sexing, where the, the grandmaster is the, the lady standing up there, and the novices or the students are down there. Now, uh, so is there actually a ranking system, or are you just... No. no. Okay, good. I'm sure that, no, I, I bet you, be I bet you the Japanese system. have, but Probably it's not. Probably doesn't involve belts. Okay, but, but I want to point out that, well, I'll, I'll, I guess it's going to come later. Um, all right, I'll get back to this, because, because it turns out that Biederman, with his geons, has, has, has given a way to get to a brown belt level, which normally takes eight months, let's say, in ten minutes, mm. with the help of language. So, um, even pigeons, by the way, can, can learn categories, learn categorization, in a sense. I mean, I want to make a distinction now between, between what's really a category, namely um, bird, for example. There are things that are birds and the things that are not birds, and that's the typical situation. Members, non-members, all or none, etc. There may be difficult cases where even ornithologists don't know whether it's a bird or not. I don't know. Uh, but those cases are not the ones we're talking about because, you see, we're cognitive scientists and we're not um, doing uh, biology or ontology, trying to decide what things really are. We're trying to explain how people can do what they can do. And if you don't know if it's a bird or not, you can't classify it, right? So the only part, the only cases that are of interest to us are the ones that you can tell apart. Now, bird is a category like that. Um, red is too. Uh, there are things that are, that are uh, different shades of red, but green is not a shade of red, right? Uh, black is not a shade of white, and white is not a shade of black. Um, however, there are also continua. There's, in fact, a continuum between black and white. And there really are shades of red. And for example, a category like big is not, it's not a category in the usual sense. It's actually just a pole of a continuum, which is relative, and you need a context. To, I mean, is, is, is this table big or not? Well, compared, that reminds me, uh, many of the, um, I, I find that most of the truths in the universe can be, uh, can be captured by about three jokes, OK? And one of the jokes that covers a huge amount of territory is the is the is the um, ma main joke, in which the um, uh, somebody asks somebody, uh, "How's your wife?" And the answer is, "Compared to what?" That's it. That's the main joke. Okay, and uh, and that is relevant. It's a sexist joke, but it's but it's uh, it's the right one for here. Namely, big, is this big? Well, compared to what? For a pigeon who's learned to peck on the left side and not on the right side, you still get a kind of a categorical curve on the left. Uh, once they've learned to peck for black and, and not peck for, uh, pardon me, pe peck the left for black and white for, for uh, right for white, then if you present stuff, see the idea is you present black or white in the middle, and they have to peck on the left if it's black and on the right if it's white. So if you present, present gray to them, if it's, if it's an almost black gray, they'll peck on the left. If it's an almost white gray, uh, uh, gray, they'll peck on the right. And if it's in the middle, there's a certain amount of uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. That's not categorical perception, but it produces a categorical boundary anyway, because uh, 
the middle point between two extremes is kind of uh, obvious. It's a reference point. It's, it, it means it's not exactly continuous. And, and that's probably, well, it's in the case of, of our uh, discrimination between hot and cold, I mean, do you think of hot and cold as being one dimension or two dimensions? Well, don't we actually have two separate senses? We do. It, 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 turn, it, 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 it is, and it feels like two it's dimensions. Two dimensions yeah, but in fact, it's, it's just temperature. I mean, temperature is just continuous. Huh. But we have this sort of lukewarm or neither body temperature as the middle point of a continuum where one way is cold and the other way is hot. And... Um, the, that middle point is a, is a special point. That it makes it possible for even every dichotomy to be split. That's also one of the reasons why some of these experiments on, on learned categorization that use continua are a little bit uh, fishy because, because middle points of continua are not just arbitrary points. Uh, but here are some of those fishy experiments. Uh, with color, it's not fishy because you have the spectrum, and it's not just black-white, it's a whole bunch of shades, and each one of them has a, ca ca a color band. Mm. So color is no problem. Uh, Badaga is no problem, because, because uh, Badaga has three categories in it. But voicing, ba pa, which is also a continuum, is more like black-white. You can synthesize every intermediate step from going from a ba to a pa, even though you can't imagine, you can synthesize it by gradual steps. And the the the, the, the um, ear will see it, it will hear it as being either a ba or a pa. It'll be a little bit mixed up towards the at the boundary. There's always a little bit of uncertainty at the boundary. But whenever you give, uh, besides the signature of categorical perception, is not just categorization. It's also discrimination, which is a relative judgment. In order to show that you have categorical perception, you have to show two things. Number one. It's, there, it's, it's shown over here. You have to show that identification along the continuum has peaks. You know, the, the, if some things are called ba, and then and then and there and then there's an uncertain region, and then some things are called da, and then some things are called ga. Just like some things are called red, and then an uncertain region, orange, and then yellow, and then uncertain green, blue, etc. That's the identification part, but the, what makes it categorical perception is, and then in that continuum, if you take equal size differences, physical differences, within categories, and then the same size difference between categories, the same size physical difference between categories will look bigger. They're more, the way we say it is they're more discriminable when they cross the category boundary than when, than when they're within the category boundary. And there, colors and badaga are like that. Ba pa is also like that. It has a boundary, and it's almost certainly a boundary like hot cold that's that's uh, that's uh, biologically prepared. But in and of itself, it could have been black and white, and it could have been just been the midpoint between the two poles. So anyway, that's just extra more more than you want to know. So we know we know the mechanism for categorical perception of color. It's this uh, three color uh, part of it anyway. Not we don't totally know it, but we know there's three, the RGB um, detectors, they're, they're different cones, and on, on top of that, not completely understood, there's the opponent processes where R is the opposite, of, red is the opposite of green, and blue is the opposite of yellow, and there's also a dark light. Some m combination of that inborn category detector system is why we see colors as categorical. We know that. But that's inborn. Uh, there's lots of things that are categorical that are not inborn and that are learned. There's two ways of learning categories. One of them is non-supervised learning. Does anybody want to have a crack at that? Oh, I just want to go back to uh, okay, I can't the go back proposition and... that they're innate. Um, we'll just, like they do all those experiments with cats and, and closing their eyes right when they're born and they lose, I know they lose depth perception, but they keep color. I don't know about cat color vision. Uh, if you, t I'm not. I don't know if cats have much so color vision. What I'm saying vision. is, what makes us believe it's innate in humans? In humans, uh, the fact that it's universal. That if you go to uh, cultures that have different category color categories, or cultures before they speak, before they've named anything, before they've been trained, and you just do um, the usual uh, sucking experiments, you find that the boundaries are the same place everywhere. I know that you have. A notion but if you that shut everything. their eyes, then 
then they probably would, would ultimately lose that. Maybe you want to argue... Yeah, that's easy to lose it. That's not when yeah. it starts with it. Uh, there's a lot of prepared categories that are use it or lose it. And, and, and some of the use it is a little bit goes in your direction in the sense it's not just ex be exposed, but kind of... Look, a famous example was uh, s s uh, r ability to see stripes in, kit in newborn kittens. And I remember the famous Heldon Hine experiment in which they... they um, they showed that if you, if you, as you said, if you if you prevent them from seeing any patterns at all, then they then they then they don't, then they can't discriminate stripes. If you let them see stripes, that then they can. But it's not enough to just see, let them see stripes. There have to be Gibsonian interactions. That they have to be um, moving in relation to stripes. Because if you have the passive kitten in the yoked experiment, they're seeing the same stripes. They're, they're in an experiment where they see black and white stripes all around. The passive kitten sees the same stripes, but that's not enough. It has to be active interaction. So there's stuff. There's stuff that you pick up by non-supervised learning. And let me define non-supervised learning. That is whatever learning you get by mere exposure. And that includes exposure with sensory motor interaction. So it's, it's not just passive exposure in that sense. It's passive in the sense that you're not being trained, you're not being asked what's this and what's that, and you don't have to do anything, but you do interact. The, the, the active kitten interacts, the passive kitten doesn't interact. Facial expressions are inborn, as I said. If you put a deck of cards, just spread, spread them out on a table, and you ask somebody, sort them. Just sort them into piles. You could either ask them, say, sort them into as many piles as you like, in which case their choice is they can sort them into 52 individual piles, individuals, or they could sort them into all red ones and black ones, or into all picture cards versus number cards, or into cards that have the same number or whatever. Lots of different ways you can sort those. It could be in two, two piles, four piles, eight piles, whatever. Uh, but clearly, in that task, there isn't a right or a wrong. You, you just sort according to the way the spirit moves you, and the spirit moves you the way according to the lay of the land. I mean, we're prepared. We already have colored detectors, so reds are going to look different from blacks. From, from uh, yeah, from blacks. Well, there's other senses in which the lay of the land has been prepared for us in, in learning to sort animals into elephants and, and, and zebras and giraffes we're helped by the fact that there isn't a continuum between zebras and giraffes. Zebras are striped and look like horses, and they have short necks, and giraffes have spots, and they're, uh, and they're brown spots, and they have long necks. So, I mean, there's no continuum. N nature has produced abrupt um, breaks between them, and that's not your kind of, in it's not innate categories, so you don't have to worry about that. But it's it's there. So I mean, you don't have to learn them because they're there. They are non-supervised learning is enough. And in fact, the general feeling is that non-supervised learning, mere exposure, is simply sharpening up either your inborn category detectors or whatever differences nature has already made, whatever natural cuts nature has made, where there's nothing in between. It just sharpens them up, right? And the original um, notion, uh, categorical perception, is defined as a kind of a compression on the inside of a category where things within a category look more similar than things between than, than, than differences between categories even if the size of the difference is the same that's what I use the red example for and the idea is that you don't need to do this compression and separation when nature has already done the separation for you as it has with giraffes and so But it's nice to, to uh, sort of highlight it a little bit more, and that's what non-supervised learning does. Supervised learning has a right or a wrong about it. When you're learning what tables are, it's, it's not just looking out there and then eventually figuring it out the way you figure out colors. People tell you, this is a table. This is not a table. You might want to you might you want to eat, and, you, and you're a child, and you sit down to see, eat at a chair. And somebody says to you, no, that's a chair. You eat at the tables, etc. So you get feedback. You get correction. And of course, in chicken sexing, you get correction, because you have the grandmaster chicken sexer looking over your shoulders and telling you, that's a male, not a female. And you, and if you're putting out things on a, on a card table, and something depends on it, like your lunch, and somebody else has decided what's the right way to sort it, and they've decided you're going to sort into four piles, you're going to sort um, red color cards, uh, red, red face cards there, black face cards there, um, red 
number cards here and uh, black number cards there. So there's four piles. But I'm not going to tell you, so you just start sorting, and I'll just tell you if you're right or wrong. Well, there you have to learn it. Except that in the case of card sorting, you already know all of the features, so this is kind of what doesn't take long. Interestingly enough, in a similar kind of experiment, not using this kind of cards, but using cards that had, yeah, uh, different shapes, triangles, uh, triangles, squares, circles, etc., uh, big ones and small ones. So it varied in in the shape, in the size, in the color, and also in the number. You could have three or two or one, etc. It, but it's similar to that. It's a card sorting task where the experimenter just says right, wrong, and let's say he has decided that everything that's green or big has to go there and everything else has to go in the other pile. So you're doing it and you're getting it right and wrong. Well, subjects will get it right. Some subjects take a long time. Some get it faster. And Bruner reported that among those that learn to do it, there are some, many, most, that can tell you the rule once they've learned it. But there are subjects that are sorting perfectly well, 100% well, but that can't tell you the rule. They say, I, I'm doing it, but I don't know, I don't know, I just know what belongs there and what belongs there, but I don't know why. Or worse, some of them will tell you a rule and it's the wrong rule, which means they couldn't have been doing it that way because if they've been following the rule that they verbalized, they'd be making mistakes. In our experiments, we haven't been able to get, at least the kinds of stuff we use, we haven't been able to get that kind of implicit learning, but that's implicit learning. And I still think, just like with the Whorf hypothesis, I think it really exists, it's just hard to show it. Mostly, learning of categories this way is explicit. And of course, the problem of the, I already talked about this, the problem of the vanishing intersections, the idea that, that uh, if you look at all of the uh, cases of table sensorily, there's nothing that they all have in common. We've already discussed that. I, I got a little bit of, out of order with these slides, but this has been already been discussed, and the dog Fido has already been discussed in, the, in connection with John, which is that whereas it's true that, as Funes says, any instance is completely unique, it's also true, as Funes couldn't know, and therefore he couldn't even talk if he re were real, there are also things that you can ignore which, make, which pick out kinds and not just individual instances. And there isn't, and there can't be vanishing intersections, despite what Fodor said, because otherwise categorization would be magic. Even innate detectors, even if you're born with a repertoire of innate detectors, they have to base their, uh, their success on invariance. Not learned invariance, but built-in invariance, but there still has to be invariance. And if there are invariants, then you may as well learn them. And uh, genes hate, I to take my word for it, genes hate to encode more than necessary because it's, it's costly and it's inefficient and it's rigid. Genes love to offload predictable things onto the environment. So if, ca <coughs> if categories <coughs> can easily be learned, why bother to pre-code them and commit yourself to it? And in the case of, of color categories, as I said, this is the mechanism. We've done some simulations with um, with uh, arbitrary, simple little categories. We took these L's. They're not exactly L's. They're horizontal and vertical lines that can vary in two dimensions. Either the bottom one is longer or the up top one is longer. You can vary those. And so we divided them into three categories, <coughs> the three on the left, middle and right. And we had neural nets, which are these backpropagation networks that have internal hidden values, <coughs> trying to categorize them. In the beginning, they were distributed like that based on their similarities. You can think of this as being sort of an analog representation. But then when we train them to, to, to separate the, first, the, the members of the first three categories and put them in a category of their own, the hidden unit values, I won't go through all of the anatomy of these nets, you'll have to believe me, migrated and moved, the, the ones in the first category moved further away from the ones in the second category and the third category so the network could put us a boundary between them. And that, would, and that compression and separation is one possible interpretation of why it is that we get categorical perception effects, which is that if it's difficult to tell things apart, we pick out the invariants, ignore all the rest, and then we see them in terms of those invariants and not the rest. You, you have to think of them as being varying, as being all, think of the, the first representation here as being the way they're represented when all of their, their uh, properties in a sort of a multi-dimensional space where all of their properties are there. And then the, later on, you ignore most of those properties and you only look at them in terms of a, a subset which separates them. 
Okay, and those are the invariants. That's the one that allows you, that's what the first category doesn't, uh, they're invariant in the sense that they're present in the first category and absent in the second and third category, and the, and the second invariant, yeah. It just reminds you of the, the sort of Zen cliche of like, in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in the expert mind there are few. Yeah, that's, that's exactly yeah. what happens. And it's for this reason. It's huh. for this reason. Um, but what that opens up, and now we're getting back into language, what that opens up is the following. If your nervous system, with implicit and explicit learning, is capable of extracting the invariance somehow, maybe using a neural net, from a certain number of cases and getting those categories grounded and the names of those categories grounded, that this is the sensory motor grounding. It's, the, it's your, your capacity to pick out the things that the category stands for, names, that the category name names, because, right? We're now talking about um, things like mushrooms that you've learned are edible or inedible, and so you call them mushrooms and toadstools. The edible ones are the mushrooms, the inedible ones are the toadstools. You're no longer going through the um, the uh, response of actually eating them. You simply say that's edible, that's or uh, edible inedible, let's say, edible inedible. And then you have other categories, which you also learn that way. And then you can have higher order categories that are really just a combination of categories you already have. Well, those you can get by words alone, like zebra. Not, of course, peekaboo unicorn is a good example, but zebra is also an example, and it's not even impossible. If you already have grounded the category horse, and you've already grounded the category striped, then you can get the category zebra. Let's say, and this is the right way to think about it, let's say your life depends on knowing what to do with a zebra, and since I'm a vegetarian, it's not going to be eating it, but you have to pet it on the head, okay? You have to know what to do with a zebra the very first time you encounter a zebra, otherwise it will eat you, okay? It sure would help if you didn't have to do trial and error learning. And somebody just told you, look, you know what a horse looks like, you know what stripes look like, a, a zebra is just a striped horse. We can do that, other species can't. Other species can only learn by induction, we can learn by instruction. Other species can only abstract directly the invariance, we can do it by hearsay. Uh, we've talked about all of this. In fact, I won't dwell on this. Um, this is uh, Funes the Memorius uh, and the fact that uh, Funes could give unique names to every one of the numbers, just like he could give, give a unique name to every time he saw Fido, because it's not Fido. It's just a bunch of unique instances. We couldn't be like that. The ugly duckling, um, you, or who was it? Was it you? No, it was Michael. It was Michael. Michael did a good job on the ugly, ugly duckling, which is that uh, if everything, if all of the features were equal, like the Zen master said, if every, then, then of course everything is infinitely different and infinitely similar to everything else. There's nothing that makes one thing more similar to another. The only way you can get privileged similarity is by giving a different weight to some dimensions, ignoring some or, or, or weighting some more heavily. That's the ugly duckling theorem. Uh, I told you this, it's a little bit out of sequence, but I said that, that in order to show that you have categorical perception, you need to do two things. You have to show that um, certain things are identified in certain ways, and then you have to show that discrimination kind of, the, the discrimination curve follows the, the categorization or identification curve. It's exactly where you have trouble telling apart whether it's a ba or a da, that discriminability is actually the greatest. You, that's where you need it. It's, it's the boundaries that you need enhancement. Within the category, all bas are pretty much the same. Okay, that's categorical perception. Uh, recoding, well, this is a pretty good example. Remember in the Miller paper, one of the things that Miller said was that uh, magical number seven plus, or, have I gone over your uh, thing? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not too far from being sure, done. Okay. Um, in the Miller paper, he said that, uh, he, that the number of 0, 1 digits that I give you in a series, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, presented visually, let's say, 0, 1, 1, the number that you can remember um, and, and say back to me after a, qu after a quick presentation is about 7 plus or minus 2. You keep going much bigger than that, and I just forget, and everything gets scrambled. But if I overtrain you to recode those binary digits into decimal so that you, you overlearn that 0000 is 
called zero. Zero, 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 one. Zero, sorry, three zeros and a one is called one. Two zeros, one zero is called two. That's just the binary code named in decimal. Are you with me? If you're overtrained, so you have those, so that when you immediately see a string of four zeros, you code it as zero, then of course you've increased your capacity for, for remembering from, from seven plus or minus two bits to seven plus or minus two decimal chunks. That's chunking, and there's a lot, a lot of cognition and categorization is that. It's rechunking when you're, and that's what's also happening when you're giving a verbal definition. You're taking, a zebra becomes a stripe, a uh, striped horse becomes a zebra. Now I don't have to talk about striped horses anymore. I can talk about zebras. These were the experiments that we did on learned categorical perception, because most of the examples I've given you, badaga, red, green, etc., have been inborn categorical perception. I didn't talk about the motor theory, but I've talked about the motor theory before. It was one kind of a partly true non-starter. But here we present textures to subjects, and they have to learn, we're, we're God, we're the experimenter, and we, we design these textures, they all look pretty similar to you, and they should. Even the easy ones look like God. How, you could, how, do you, how are you going to know which one's which? And yet, we, we design them so that within an hour, which is about the attention span of the usual undergraduate for a psychology experiment, within an hour, about a half of the subjects manage to learn which which, this is a dichotomy, which category to put these textures into. We say that it's a computer graphics artist, and there's two of them, and they have two different styles, and you've got to figure out which one is which. And, they're, and the, each one is different. It's like Funes and Memorias. We never just, they're not just memorizing special cases. They're, they're and an infinite, we're taking an infinite uh, sample, taking in individuals from an infinite sample. And what happens with the easy one, where you don't, where really after a few presentations, it's obvious which ones are done by, by, uh, uh, I forget what name we gave, but let's say artist X and artist Y. Um, the hard ones are harder. If you look at the curves, first of all, the, the learning curves, we do it so that half the subjects manage to learn the hard ones within an hour, and half the subjects don't. You can, you can just uh, uh, um, putter with the ease of the, of the thing in order to make it come out so that in an hour that's what you get. So the upper curve there is the learning curve of the subjects that, that succeed and the lower curve is the ones that don't succeed. They stay near chance for the, for the entire hour. And then uh, if you look at, uh, at the performance, the ones that <clears throat> the ones that have um, learned, and we're only looking at the ones that have learned, uh, when it's the easy ones, when it's easy stimuli, that's the ones on the left, uh, you get this acquired distinctiveness effect, unsupervised learning. Everything becomes somewhat more different from everything else, but, but nothing other than that. Everything becomes a little bit separated, right? That's all. But for the hard ones, the ones where it really does, you need some help at the boundaries, there's categorical perception. The, the uh, discriminability within the category gets compressed, and the discriminability between the categories of textures gets enhanced. That's learned categorical perception. That's the signature of learned categorical perception. Now, what... I'm sorry, can you, can you just say the result of the experiment again? The difference between easy and hard? Uh, the disc remember I said categorical perception has, a sig has two things you have to look at. Yeah. How do you identify them? And then how well can you discriminate them within and between categories? Okay. And it turns out that before they learned and after they learned, if you look at the discriminations, within category discriminations compared to before became compressed and between category discrimination, be, remember before there are no categories, you're just giving but discrimination. You said not for easy ones? Yeah. It didn't happen for easy ones. But it's, hmm. it's still categorical perception. No, it's just categorization. The point is, categorical perception is not the same as categorization. Categorical perception is when learning a category makes things look different. And uh -huh. the point is, they don't always, for black, to, you know, for some stuff it's too trivial. It only happens when you need this kind of special enhancement. But what oh. did happen, and what happens all the time, is this um, enhan general unsupervised enhancement, which is from being exposed to things, it makes them a little bit more distinct. It's, called, it's also called the acquired distinctiveness of cues. Oh. Behavior has talked about it as well. Oh. Now, if we move to chicken sexy, this <coughs> an interesting uh, demonstration was done by Irv Biederman, at UC, uh, University of Southern California. He has a theory of uh, visual perception, you don't need to know it, um, consisting of um, geons, little elementary geometrical shapes, out of which he thinks he can build all other shapes. 
Maybe he can, maybe he can't. But using the gene, but it's a way to analyze vis visual shapes. And um, he took uh, novice chicken sexes, chicken sexes ab about, about whom the legend was that it takes eight months to get to uh, brown belt level chicken sexing. You know, it's not perfect chicken sexing. That takes two years or more with masters. But, but you have to be, go through this training for eight months to be able to reach brown belt level. He gave them 10 minutes of training using geons. He, he had analyzed chicken bottoms, his computer analyzed them, and made it into a geon rule saying, look, a male is the one that has this, this, and this. And he trained them for 10 minutes just on a geon rule. And he got them to uh, eighth degree, uh, to, uh, to brown belt level in performance. And that is an illustration of the power of, of language. It's not strictly language because if they had already overlearned what a geon was, the same way you overlearned uh, decimal for, for binary, then it would have been purely linguistic. But since he had to use pictures, it was sort of show and tell. Okay. But you get the drift. Um, we did experiments. This is going to come back. I'm not going to dwell on this because there's a whole session that's going to be dwelling on this more. We did experiments on the evolution of language, artificial life experiments, in which we presented, don't worry if you don't get all of this, I don't even want to dwell on this because we're going to spend a whole hour on this eventually, but, but we took an artificial life simulation where creatures had to learn to categorize, little Pac-Man-like creatures had to learn to categorize little mushroom-like things, and we had mushrooms that had features, spotted, long, stem, dark, etc., etc., and the neural nets were doing the learning. And what we showed was that um, if, you, if you teach them by supervised learning, to, uh, trial and error, the old way, the, the induction that we share with animals, if you teach them which mushrooms are edible, not teach them, but you train them on which, which ones are edible. And you also train them on, we invented these categories, but there's these, these mushrooms that are, are markable. If they have certain features, you've got to mark the place where they are. Never mind. It's just an invented thing. So, so they learn edible mushrooms, and they learn markable mushrooms the way all other creatures on the planet do when they learn, which is by trial and error, and the, which is risky and time-consuming, right? And, and, and then we have a third category, and these are the returnable mushrooms. These are the mushrooms ecologically that you're supposed to return to where they were. And it turns out that the return mushrooms can be learned two different ways. Either the same way you learned edible and markable, which is by trial and error, and making mistakes, getting, you know, sometimes eating a mushroom that makes you sick, etc. So, uh, or by, by uh, hearsay, you could, you could overhear uh, organisms that already knew which ones were returnable and go by that. Now, the properties I'm telling you the, the secret, the properties, the invariant properties of returnable mushrooms were simply the disjunction, that is, the and, you, you just Boolean anded the properties of edible mushrooms and the property of markable mushrooms. So uh, returnable means edible and markable, right? And you can learn that two different ways. You can learn it the old hard way, time-consuming, risky way, or by hearsay. And we created little creatures where some were allowed genetically to, to learn it by hearsay and others weren't. And within a few generations, there were no more. Um, we called it learning by, by uh, toil, which is the hard way, and by theft, which is the linguistic way. Well, within a few generations, that's what these curves show, the, uh, the toilers had all died out. <laughs> theft is immensely more um, adaptive than toil. I'll get back to that in a moment. So that's what allows you to say that a zebra is a horse with stripes. That's what allows you to say Apple is red rather than just red apple. Cognition is categorization. And I think we're near the end. Oh, yeah. This is, uh, oh, yeah. We also did some physiological experiments on the, on the textures. Um, 